Hi, everybody. Um, thank you all so much for coming tonight. What a nice crowd here to see Jose Vadi. Um, we're going to have a great reading tonight. I just wanted to give you a, a quick preview of um, some of the other events that are coming up. Uh, we've got two other events um, this year at the library, plus a few others that will be at the museum. You can stay tuned for those announcements. Um, but we've got, we're going to have the poet Jesse Nathan on Tuesday, November 14th. That'll be here as well as live streamed. And the fiction writer Lydia Conklin on Tuesday, March 12th. Both of those events are at 4.30, both of them here and on Zoom. Um, it's so wonderful to partner with the library for this, this series. Thank you, Jessica, and everybody else here. Um, now we're going to have Elena Negron, who is a um, graduate student in fiction in the creative writing program, who's going to say some words about Jose before we get started. Elena. Hey, good afternoon. I'm Elena. Uh, thank you, Zenzi, for giving me the opportunity to um, present the main speaker for this evening, even though I am, as Jose calls it, an out-of-town city slicker. Um, so, okay. Jose Vadi is an award-winning essayist, poet, and playwright. His work has appeared in the Paris Review, The Atlantic, The Yale Review, and the skateboard publications Quarter Snacks and Free Skate Magazine. He's also the author of Interstate, Essays from California, and Chipped, Writing from Skateboarder's Lens, which is forthcoming from Soft Skull Press. He's also an avid skateboarder and a filmmaker. The collection Interstate is a contradiction of things. Body expresses both love and frustration for California. He shows the California that holds the generations of migrant farm workers and Asian continent diasporas while simultaneously going through multiple tech booms. The culture of California and its implications for Jose, a Mexican, as he self-describes, cannot be lost on the reader in these essays. Themes of racism, historical context, and cultural impact have been woven into the collection from the beginning title essay, Interstate, to the concluding essay, 14th and Jackson, and the afterward. But it's often the people in the stories who reflect what Jose is attempting to impress upon the reader. It's as if through a viewfinder, he forefronts his own grandfather's movement through California, his friend's work at a low-paying nonprofit in the Bay Area, the business of a Korean owner of an Oakland bar that welcomed weekly regulars. He ties the history of these people to the places where they reside and does it so strongly that it's clear contemporary people are directly influenced by the historical past. With consistent references to his grandfather and a dedication to understanding the past of California, Interstate brings up the significance of intergenerational experiences, which in turn explore the equally present theme of, of temporality, especially the impact that temporality has on a place that you thought belonged to you. I'm in a seminar about writing and place, and we had the pleasure of speaking to Jose earlier this afternoon, and I asked him why California was important to him, and he said a lot of things, most strikingly. He said that these places are important because they won't be here forever, and the importance is the value in them now. While Jose speaks specifically about his family and history of California, he is so artfully, he so artfully allows the, for the identification across state lines. He invites the reader to California, to a California that is fleeting and temporal, a place that is kept so off limits for so many. He is not trying to impress upon the reader the specialness of California. Instead, he gives the facts and his connections and lets the lens of his experience be what makes the place special. There's something humble there, and humble is wonderfully inviting in a state that can so often be described otherwise. He asks and explores the question, who has the power to navigate California? He argues that it's no one, though it feels that this book leaves no California mountain or river left uncrossed. I truly think that for me, there is no better collection to understanding the intricacies of the state, its history, and its people. So, Jose, bye. Uh, can we give a round of applause for Elena once again? Thank you very much. No, no. We can all go home now. That was amazing. Uh, thank you. Hi. Uh, hello. My name is Jose. Uh, I'm here to read to you all today. Uh, I'm excited to be here. My book came out in the pandemic in 2021, so opportunities to read and share work in any context was limited when this thing came out. Um, I feel like I'm still kind of making up for lost time. So it's great for everyone to be here today. Thank you. 
Um, I don't take it for granted. I don't take for granted like this room, this mic, everything. Like I really, really appreciate it. So thank you. Um, in addition to that, I want to thank I want to thank Zinzi for the for the invite. I want to thank Andre Nafishelli. I want to thank Marcelo Montoya. I want to thank Chris Macias and many people here at UC Davis who have made me feel welcome um, over the past year. So I work on campus and uh, doing marketing in Merak, and uh, it's nice to be here as a writer. All right, um, so I'm going to be reading from um, the aforementioned book Interstate. I'll be reading reading from the title essay. And I'll be kind of bounce. It's a very long essay, so I created this excerpt of an excerpt that bounces around the whole thing. Hopefully, it'll work out. And then I will be reading from Chipped. This comes out next year. No one's heard anything from it, so you guys are the first to hear it. And I look forward to sharing that with you. Um, all right. So yeah, this is called Interstate. In the digitized high eight footage, my abuelo's home remains. The massive fruit tree and retaining wall dividing the backyard from the shared neighborhood rear alley. An old California farm town with many ditches in the middle of an alley, dead ending at the wash, carrying water down from the San Gabriel Valley foothills of San Dimas, Mount Baldy, Mount San Antonio and beyond, down and through the suburbs and river of the same SGV namesake, somewhere near El Monte's collision with the Irwindale mineral mines and drag races, that infamous 10605 interchange. Clipped to his white undershirt is the lavalier mic I just purchased at Radio Shack up the street that used to house a remodeled Kmart and no longer houses kids skating its loading docks before stealing rolls of film. The lavalier is plugged into the wrong part of the hi eight camera, which had been boxed and unused for years on my dad's dresser. Thankfully, the camera's built-in microphone catches Abuelo's words clearly after a brief test shot of him curiously introducing himself to the camera. Antonio Gomez, the expression on his face like he was hearing his name aloud for the first time. My abuelo exists between my first and last names, Jose, which I share with my father, and Vadi, the last name of our Afro-Boricua ancestors who took the name of their Corsican sugar plantation landowner Vadi, erasing their indigenous name, Baye, according to my dad, Jose Miguel, whose first name I bear before Antonio, my mother's father. Jose Antonio Gomez Vadi, two patriarchs resting like gargoyles on either side of my tongue multiple namesakes for a worldview inherited to honor and evolve. I begin my interview. My mom sits behind me playing translator, my original Spanish lost by kindergarten. Still, Abuelo and I have communicated through the fragmented fluency I've smoothed into proficiency. My questions are about him and his life, his origin story, those stories we've grown up hearing about, hopping trains as an Oki and heading west from Nebraska to California, of running away from immigration, of slowly getting the entire Gomez tribe into the states in piecemeal stages, of working before settling in the towns a few miles west of where my sister and I were raised, but in, but in as seemingly distant an era as our, fatherhood's, our father's childhood in East Harlem by way of Santurce, Puerto Rico. That side of the lineage, however small, benefited from my historian father's ability to remember and research, the larger Gomez side's root starts here, with a man who wouldn't let me in the house without a clean shave and short hair, the same abuelo who told a cousin not to come inside wearing an early 90s hoop earring slightly dangling from his ear because he looked like a girl, just a handful of the residual conservative qualities reminding me and my generation that the generation before us did not experience such a benevolent man while I, sitting behind the camera, exploit the benefit of the doubt incarnate that is being a grandchild, finding the answers few in our family have documented. He sits poised in a sullied but functional white plastic chair. A long fold down pool chair adorned with pillows with old shirts rests on the other side of his lemon tree, his outside napping area for the last 30 years. He was already in his late 80s at the time of the filming and I was sober enough in my somewhat reckless 20s to know that this access like his memory would end sooner rather than later. I didn't know he had already purchased his own burial plot right next to the one where the grandmother I barely knew had been resting since just before I turned two. Both plots just off the main road in Rose Hills, purchased for 600 American dollars. Unfathomable now when the state's real estate economy still hits families' pocketbooks from six feet under the cost of California soil. 
I didn't know sitting there kneeling next to the makeshift tripod that nearly four years later, I'd be sitting in that same front room of his house, watching him transition into an afterlife I didn't hope to see anytime soon. His medical bracelets and wallet, his bandanas, those odd Mickey Mouse white gloves I used to hold the reins of his casket and other ephemera are still in my possession as I'm trying to hold on to these things and this person. And if those four years studying history in Berkeley did anything, the years he instructed me to charge bonganas, it was to prove the power not just of being there, but of telling different stories than those than the supposed exalted victors of this Californian land. Toward the end of our interview, I ask Abuelo if Mexico circa 2007 will become like Colombia, with the cartels and governments in a dance with US aid on all sides with paramilitaries and whatnot. Yeah, es, he replies. We both laugh silently at this, the most progressive of comments you will find from someone who probably still disapproves of my Rage Against the Machine t-shirts that I hid under hoodies on sunny days when stopping by. I don't know why it took me years to digitize this tape to see him and hear his voice again. It's still hard to drive by his former home, which was also my home. I am lucky this tape outlived my laziness. These memories I am still trying to hold while watching my abuelo, mi chaparro, appear on a screen before me, stooping slightly with his cane at this age, showing my uncle a particularly new harvest of tomatoes he's proud of, which, if picked and boxed, are less than a full field row, a thimble of its lucrative worth, which doesn't matter now that, that the tomatoes are grown by him for him. I take screenshots from the film to hold these memories with me wherever I go. New images of a house I visited daily. Its phone number as memorized as the feel of the furniture, the smell of the varnish, the cabinets now in my sister's home in a different part of a still unfamiliar state. A state I'd rather die in than live outside its borders. Tomatios de Mexico greet me on site when I re-enter the backyard, filming his truck and the chair and all the small new crops he just reintroduced to his son before I settle on the shot of Abuelo finding his chair and sitting again now, his cane-assisted walk, a long one for him at that stage, his eldest child and his youngest child, my mother, standing near him under his lemon trees that smelled so fresh in our hands or beneath the stickiness of our shoes as kids. They all stare back at me now, camera in hand, eye in the viewfinder, devoid of questions and shooting instead the security found within our familial silence, giving voice to these harvest, on his Californian land to testify. I continue to trace Abuelo's steps after the spring thaws out the Salinas Valley, searching for something we can share here in Gonzales. The line of sight from the water tower, the view of the railroad from the fields, the signs marking the historic El Camino Real. This is where Abuelo executed graveyard irrigation shifts circa 1946 before he was deported. I'm driving in the early morning sun down the stretch of 101 from Salinas to King City, California's Salad Bowl, wondering if Abuelo ever had the mobility I do today, unemployed in a Prius, taking a weekday trip to trace the steps he wanted nobody else to find. Despite the agricultural industry of Monterey County generating over $4 billion in revenue in 2018, a 2016 reported, a report noted that the Salinas Valley is the fifth least affordable place to live in the country with farm workers the most affected. Many live in the squalor characterized in and seemingly evolving from Steinbeck's Depression era text. Yet even signs over park benches along the walls of the Steinbeck Center in downtown Salinas read, no overnight camping. Today in East Salinas, three farm worker families split a downtrodden one bedroom, the tourist industry dollars of Monterey seeming an entirely country away. The California Institute of Rural Studies action plan discovered that in Salinas and Pajaro Valleys, an additional 45,000 units of farm worker housing are needed to alleviate critical overcrowding. And not just for single men, the study found over 5,000 affordable and permanent farm worker housing units were necessary to meet the overwhelming need for affordable, permanent, year-round housing. I drive past the two bars in Gonzales where I knew Abuelo sometimes had a beer, according to my mother, who drove through town with him a few years before he died. I find a brand new city park across the street from a large field with laborers actively and steadily picking up and down the rows. The seatbelt equipped white school buses and rows of clean portable bathrooms sit in their narrow dirt access roads beneath them. Testaments to those small safeguarded amenities the UFW and many more unions fought for on the workers' behalf against the growers and their allies in local government. 
I breathe in the cool air and, and stare into the agricultural meets suburban Americana scene before me. Kids being kids on the basketball court while their parents potentially perform the labor their generation won't. Many leaving the valley and either never coming back or returning with new innovations. Gonzalez is seen as a small local model of economic innovation, leasing new wind turbines to tailor farms for revenue. These few massive sentinels that loom over every part of town. Town is so linked to weed farms and tech firms, cutting through red, type, red tape like an excited stockbroker. Who in this scene before me will become CEOs of these new enterprises? I head toward the turbines in the bigger fields west of 101 along River Road, a few miles from the original factory built town of the valley Spreckles. The, eleva the elevated view from the road allows me to see the breath of the Salinas salad bowl. I pull over at a turnout, take it all in. This part of California that has helped feed nations for generations, where Abuelo once worked all night. And my mind wanders, envisioning him in the middle of a long shift, moving and reinstalling 20 plus pound pipes all over the field, ensuring its health and future profit in the dead cold moonlight. I imagine him smoking a joint, that sweet racialized devil lettuce now legalized and ready for sale before whispering a la chingada and turning the pipes on full blast, flooding the fields to a point of no profitable return, no computer auto shutting off this perfect sabotage, a cog in the wheels of an abusive industry feeding America one unpaid worker at a time with deportation raids conveniently executed at the end of harvest. I drive toward Chular, to the roadside handmade cross I passed on the way to Gonzales. It's here where Alta Street meets Boone that 32 braceros of the more than 50 on board a bus were killed on September 17, 1963. The driver, his vision already impaired, yet hired and approved to transport human life, failed to see the oncoming Southern Pacific Railroad train, deciding to play Frogger on the wrong part of the road at the end of a long workday. Considered the deadliest automobile crash in US history, it sparked an outcry among activists and farm workers alike, yet evidence of the malicious care given to Bracero workers. The program began in 42 as a wartime measure to meet domestic agricultural demand through a series of agreements with the Mexican government through 1964. The agreements didn't note that bribery was widely considered the best way to gain the best contracts, those above the 30 cent minimum wage, nor was the celebratory DDT shower upon stateside arrival noted in the contracts, same with missing wages or unreceived paychecks, the Bracero's liberties ending like a contract's term. I take a photo of the cross while laborers work in the field at the background across the street, those same old white school buses and portable bathrooms nearby on the cross street. There's no date for when this DIY cross was erected and no knowing how long it took for it to fall apart from the weather. A plastic green produce tie connects the left side of the cross to the electrical power line, supporting the memorial against the wind. It's Mexican and American flags heavily tattered and frayed. The top of the cross reads RIP, formatted like a staircase descending left to right until it reaches the word LOS. And the horizontal portion of the cross reads 32 braceros, small, tacked on cardboard squares, read 17 and 1963 for the day and the year of the incident, the number nine for the month missing in action, the shadow of the cross falling in the direction of the accident's points of impact. The sounds of truck and train engines haunting the cemetery are clearer than the sight of the mass grave I'm looking for at the edge of Fresno's Mountain View Cemetery. I can't find the tombstone just only five years old, bearing the name of 28 previously anonymous ghosts, simply known as Mexican citizens. What appears to be a metallic electric generator grate is on the side close to the fence. I walk toward it, finding it to be a massive tombstone instead, the tangible output of a writer and a priest using all possible funeral and Mexican government records to identify and name those formerly anonymous bodies killed after the plane deporting them, taking them to El Centro via Burbank, crashed into the side of the Coalinga Mountains west of I-5 on January 28, 1948. I take a photo from the top of the grave looking east. The original plaque is included at the base of the mass grave and new memorial slab. 28 Mexican citizens who died in an airplane accident near Coalinga, California on January 28, 1948, RIP, it reads. 
You buy signs, advertise 100 new grave sites available for purchase, pre-registration incentives included. Today, it's hard to imagine amid another housing crisis in California, 10 years ago, Stockton and San Bernardino went bankrupt, partially due to a slew of new, house, new, homes, new homes built on subprime loans. A suburban sprawl in the middle of the valley is the trend facing us, facing towns south of Fresno like Lemoore and Hanford with the developers pitching high-speed rail to the moon in hopes of a new cell. And I imagine living here, maybe somewhere near the Thai Buddhist table I saw on the drive here, visiting my abuelo's grave, one he didn't pay for every weekend. What if my grandfather had been deported by air instead of by train or bus in 1946? Would his fate have been as unnamed and unremarkable as that of those 28 in Koalinga or, or as politicized as that of the 32 in Chular? Maybe this explains the only wish he expressed to my mom, to die in his own home knowing full well the dimensions of those graves at the farthest edge of a cemetery's grounds. I drive south more aware of the sense of borrowed time than ever before and ask myself, who has the power to navigate California? I immediately answer nobody. We all pay a cost whenever we decide to move anywhere within this state. It's why locals here steady their speeding trucks against moments of grotesque acceleration to save gas. It's the privilege of my free, jobless time to explore the official and lived histories of those before us in the state, pillaged, conquered, and divided by the Civil War. If I continue to follow the clues of Abuelo's path to California, going all the way to Oklahoma and Nebraska, to as many fields between here and there that still remain, will I meet others like me? living between our known reality and the gray areas of the displaced narratives preceding us, spread across memory, oral history, burnt photos without smiles? Will we discuss our mother's favorite bands and how their mothers, like mine, spent their paychecks on new vinyl and headphones so their parents couldn't hear the mind-bending sounds of 68? How bad our Spanish is and how we still talk to our elders in the morning, knowing they're awake watching? I repeat Abuelo's phone number to myself as much as his address, his final destination, or at least where I last saw him breathing, repeating the numbers and letters to myself, a history built on land he acquired. I was standing in a California state landmark when he passed, Mills Hall at Mills College in East Oakland. My father on the phone describing the scene to me of Abuelo with the in-house hospice, meeting an extremely known fate. I was thankful for the end of his body's suffering while immediately longing for his voice, the way his jaw trembled when he laughed, the leather of his skin, the kindness of his eyes, wondering when I digitized that tape. In the dead of night, I wanna place a plaque at his former home noting, here stands a home formerly owned by a Mexican national near the, bend of, near the bed of roses my abuela maintained by the front window, but instead I repeat his wish to die in my home to myself. Just as I remember the sound of his laugh, his posture, his feeding of the black, Yard, uh, his feeding of the backyard blue jays, his maintenance of his crops, and the way he nicknamed me Chaparro for being the tallest in our family. The scenes are a marathon playing in my mind like a personal memorial built of rotten beets, broken septic tanks, a border agent slurs, the mire of sleeping in dirt at night, and this memorial standing in my mind and illuminated on every drive between the parts of California I call home. A memorial like a handmade cross for 32 bodies flying 100 feet into a pool of blood as drivers accelerate past its perpendicular stakes towards their future, one that, for this temporarily stuck Californian, ends in flames. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, so changing paces. I wrote a book about skateboarding. It's called Chipped, Riding from the Skateboarder's Lens. It looks like this. It'll be coming out next April. Um, a lot of it was inspired by a lot of the journeys and road trips of interstate. Um, in that essay I read about, I go to skate parks in the Central Valley as well and kind of realize that skateboarding is, is a lens that I write from um, heavily, so I decided to write from it. Um, this is the title essay of the piece, and it's a, it's a short piece, and we'll we'll call it a reading after that, and I'm, I look forward to answering any questions uh, you guys may have. Um, but yeah, this is called Chipped, and I've never read it 
uh, allowed other than to my cat knuckles. So um, hope you guys enjoy. I skated my favorite deck so long, its final abused form was a jangled rocket ship. All deformed, bruised nose and short, flattened tail, I rode that baby blue board off sets of stairs and loading docks for months, slid it across curbs and benches, threw it in the bushes to enter somewhere that didn't allow skateboards, returning to find it lying there, undisturbed and unwanted by those unfamiliar with its magic potential. It was a shop board sold by my local skate shop, Utility Board Shop. Its logo just above the four drill marks two by two for the back tricks base plate and the hardware holding it together. The L in utility was spelled with an Olympic torch treatment. It was probably skinny as hell for the era and my age, less than eight inches wide and perfect for a 13 year old. Shop boards were cheaper than pro boards and slightly more than factory blanks since they were dipped in a coat of paint and maybe had the shop's logo slapped on somewhere painfully obvious. Model boards paid the skater a certain amount per sale, while the artists were, went from making hourly rates in the early 90s to flat rates by the decade's end. The ink, the laminate, the wood, the shipping, the manufacturing, the storage, all of that is what those pr prices gauge for. I rode shop boards constantly growing up due to the price point. Big footed, lanky, and tall, puberty hit at the same time as my fervent appreciation for skateboarding, with more and more boards snapping upon impact. The girl skateboards Guy Mariano pro board with the Italian flag, snap trying a quick flip down a five stair at Laverne's municipal water treatment plant. The Adrian Lopez pro model zero skateboards deck with the four horsemen drawing, snapped on a ledge trick one week into ownership before I could even chip the board on accident. But it was this sky blue shop board that felt so proper, so intrinsic to my skateboarding at the time that upgrading to a new board and discarding whatever opportunities it still had seemed akin to self-harm. We alone had to coexist for this many weeks, months after all, why not see how long it will last? The feel of change is both superstition and microcosm, an approach to the tools of our joy that says something about those joyful dimensions really look and feel like. Skaters approach each trick attempt with the maneuver's muscle memory and a confidence affected by the cracks in the sidewalk, sirens from the streets, and fear. With every board, we materialize a ledger of everything learned and experienced upon it. The more centered the middle board marks, the better the board size we're getting. Hangers on front trucks jaggedly destroyed in 45 degree patterns showcasing attempted crooked grinds. I liked writing random crap on my, on my stickers as they got shredded or at my most dreamy, scrawling carpe diem and whiteout on the grip tape just above the back truck along the side, as if I would forget to seize the day at age 12, 13 and beyond, let alone for something as addictive as skateboarding. Now I consider why I didn't get a better used deck or save for a clean new version of a toy I love to use every day. A toy that can travel across time and space, measure how fast my body could adjust to a crack before the takeoff point at the top of some stairs, or muscle through a grind along a worn, chewed concrete ledge. So much of discovering actual core skateboarding is literally acquiring its component parts. Before I could afford skate shops, I found most of my first pairs of trucks, sets of wheels, even shoes through friends. Identifying skaters by their gear allowed these conversations about skating to happen. Skate fashion at a bat signal as much as a shield against mainstream society and our bruises, the scabs on the elbows and how the more scabs indicated regular or goofy footed, the torn sneakers, the arm cast and finger splints, or in my case years later, the crutches from a sprained knee. They'd hand me down or resell their Thunder B-52 trucks, their first model S Air Costum Pro model shoes, the toes chewed away on the side of my weaker lead foot, afforded the shoes a second life on a skater with a different stance. Chipping a board is a natural part of skating. A chip is literally those small pieces of board that break off from the nose and tail from the wear and tear of skateboarding. Novice or pro, you'll see skaters riding chipped boards, but when you're a kid, a chipped board is kind of a rite of passage. Without disposable income, kids ride, kids ride boards until they nearly disintegrate. The grip tape all mashed up and jangled along the edges where wood used to be. Filling in the chips keeps the board going as long as possible. It's a symbol for the stubborn dedication toward a deck and to a toy, as skaters and as adults, whose bodies will also reach their inevitable end. But the toy's purpose evolves beyond a fad and becomes something more, a compass, a lens, a portal, to a portal to joy only found by trying and failing along the way. 
The irony is that the older I get, the more I, I empathize with those chipped birds I had as a kid, hiding marks and blemishes while maintaining the semblance of a skater as an adult, not wanting to be discarded, wanting to still be seen as useful, functional, and skating bruised and chipped for as long as possible. Thank you. I'm going to transition to the seated portion. Um, but yeah, if anyone has any questions, we can uh, we can answer them, right? Or I can answer them. I feel very tall now. This is very tall. Sure. figuring out that skateboarding was like what it meant. And um, I'm wondering just how how you started to kind of figure figure that out and piece that together. Um, particularly with these, these skate parks that you know are kind of out of the way. Yeah, like um um I quote the question was just like how you know encountering all these skate parks through interstate, how did that impact like um my writing and just approach to writing more about skateboarding and that that lens. I think I realized as I was writing Interstate and I was doing the research and I was like drawing maps of California and figuring out where I wanted to travel and with the different parts I engage with, naturally as a skateboarder, I already started looking up like skate shops and spots nearby and trying to figure out like what else is there if I get stuck in my research and I, I hit a wall and I need to kill some time, like maybe I can go check out some skate stuff. And it's at that point, I, I, I thought it was unrelated to my writing. Um, but as I started finishing the essay that I that I read earlier and started writing other essays about the Bay Area and its changing nature, I started writing. There's one essay in the Interstate called Spot Check, which is about like pursuing different skate spots that are at risk of being destroyed or demolished in San Francisco and the Bay Area. So like the road trips in Central Valley and and kind of realizing, oh, everywhere I go, I try to find the skate kind of component or the skate, the cultural skate thing that's in this area, um, kind of like made me realize that I was underutilizing that part of my like my lens. And here's this lens that allows you to see space and um, and just navigate space entirely differently. I was kind of doing that as a pedestrian walking around these different fields. And I mean, as I describe, I'm just like a dude unemployed with a Prius just walking around and like kind of taking it in. Um, but it kind of made me realize that I was almost employing a skateboarder looking for skate spots, but instead I was employing that tactic towards like chasing my grandfather's history. So I kind of just realized the importance of that lens and then um, and how it could impact my writing. And um, yeah, that, I think one of the cool things that I realized too was that skateboarding is oftentimes stereotyped as like this big city activity and, you know, finding those those parts and kind of destroying that like big city slicker identity that I have in the book was realizing like here's communities all over California that are that are doing it that are trying to do something like are trying to go out and learn a new trick or build community that way and it kind of just made me realize much like a lot of interstate that we all have this idea of California and as skaters we all have this idea of skateboarding and oftentimes those are like borderless ideas. Like they, they they might be rooted in a place, but they can kind of apply everywhere. So whether it's a California identity or a skateboarder's lens, I kind of realized that they were um, very similar. And so um, there was a lot of kind of telling myself like it's okay to write as a skateboarder because like I was basically realizing my entire worldview as a writer was, in, was inspired by skateboarding. That was my sale on Montoya, ladies and gentlemen. Shout out, shout out. Yes. So I, I read this interview with you um, and your editor. Um, and you were talking about the process. I don't know if you remember what yeah. you were that. Yeah, and you were talking about the process of, of um, creating interstate. Um, and it, it kind of started out as like a correspondence between the two of you yeah. and kind of started building the essays up over time. And I as you were reading, um <laughs> it immediately struck me that you you read like a poet. <laughs> um like a really good poet. Um 
And I understand that you sort of maybe started out as a poet, and then it, my point is, it seems like the process of you coming to nonfiction seems like a kind of gradual one. Yeah. And I'm wondering what brought you there, um, what's important to you in nonfiction, and and why why nonfiction only. Thank you. Um, the question was just around like approaching nonfiction, um, given my poetry background and given the way that I um, wrote this book kind of as like letters with an editor, really. Um, yeah, I got, I started doing spoken word as an undergrad um, at UC Berkeley. There's a Cal Slam um, and I started just showing up to open mics and slams and getting uh, good criticism and feedback from like the people that were running it. And it was a really, um, that was my entry point into writing. Um, before that, growing up in LA, there was this HBO show called Deaf Poetry Jam that came out around 2001, very much dating myself here. This is probably the year you guys were born. And uh, like, it, I started recording it to VHS, also dating myself, and like, kind of like creating YouTube, right? I was like watching it, learning it, and then just like seeing how spoken word poets do their thing. Um, a lot of these spoken word poets um, really help define the scene and the culture that we that we have today. Um, so I performed spoken word like all through undergrad, all through my twenties, and I didn't start writing nonfiction like officially until I went to grad school when I was like twenty six in, in two thousand ten in Mills College, and I was basically exhausted with performing arts speaking personally because it felt very ephemeral which initially was very exciting like one night only check out this show it's awesome but I wanted and the interstate talks about this explicitly like I really wanted to create more like historical documents I wanted something with greater longevity uh, you know something that I could share with everyone that maybe is not in a physical space um, and you know I kind of so it led to like going to grad school and getting indoctrinated with nonfiction and figuring out um, my voice really. I didn't come out of grad school with a manuscript or anything like that, but I started pitching to like, you know, journals around town, like, and started reporting on local music scenes and just trying to like hack away at like, what nonfiction stories do I want to tell? And it led to submitting to all these like literary journals. And I found an editor, Mensa DeMary, who was like kindly rejecting me. He was just like, this is cool, but like, think about it this way, think about it this way. And I had this series of postcards that I was writing to friends, and then I would transcribe those postcards, turn them into poems, and submit them to Mensa. And so like, it was, it was a series called Postcards for, to My Friends Uptown, who were living in Harlem in New York. And that was the start. I met an editor who cared and gave me a shot. And we started like writing back and forth and I sent an essay that's an interstate called Getting the Susies about going to this bar in San Francisco every week. And I sent him another essay about California, another essay about California. And he started realizing like, you're writing, all your writings about California in place. Have you ever considered writing a book? So basically myself and this editor created this book um, through email, like just through correspondences, like shooting ideas back and forth with each other. He was working at Soft School Press, my publisher, and we just created this correspondence of just trying to generate writing. Some of that writing was published online over the years. Um, but I feel like my personal fiction, I really didn't give myself that, that confidence to do it until I went to school and kind of understood and realized, I think this is answering your original question, that all these genres are parts of storytelling and that um, I can access the different ones I want depending on the, the style or the kind of stories I want to tell. Um, but I feel like nonfiction gave me the confidence to kind of speak in the first person in ways that poetry wasn't allowing. I, I wasn't able to find that in poetry. In, in plays, I was doing more fiction and stuff like that. But I basically found like my voice through grad school in this relationship with my editor. And between those two things, it kind of gave me the agency to just like, start writing about the things I care about most. So starting in the Bay Area and then starting um, with writing about Southern California. Um, I'll be answering your question as well as I could. I basically found in nonfiction all the things I wasn't finding in poetry and playwriting, which was the ability to weave history, the kind of politics of literature and prose, and um, place, 
all in this kind of DNA strand that is like my nonfiction. It was like this intersection that I realized I can take all my learnings from performing arts and poetry. I can take that energy of language and that poetics and put it in prose that has more of a structure and more of a narrative, more of a sense of literal and figurative places and tell stories across, and this is another reason it's in my fiction, a bigger canvas, you know, across 50 pages or three pages, you know, um, having more time than like a three minute poem or a three minute spoken word piece um, and giving myself that or or three nights of a play and then it's gone. So the longevity of, of the type of writing um, as well as weaving history, narrative and, and um, the type of prose I was kind of bringing from poetry was definitely a goal in my nonfiction writing. Um, so I kind of just consider myself a writer you know, um, nonfiction is definitely my focus, but I still write poems. I still have fiction ideas that I will get to one day. But, you know, I hope that better answers your question. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you. I was wondering just about timelines. It sounds like... Uh, you were working back and forth with the editor, you know, what, from start to finish, yeah. how, how long was that process for you? Let's see. So, working backwards, Interstate came out in September 20, 2021. The final, like, copy was done in, like, December 2020. First draft is probably, like, March 2020, like, right at the start of the pandemic, I think is when we finished it which was like a brutal kind of irony. Um, the first essay in the book, Getting to Susie's, is like 2016, 2017. So like three essays from the book, yeah, three essays from the book came out around like 2017, 2018, 2019, Getting to Susie's, Standing in the Shadow of Brands, The California Inquiry. Um, so maybe like the first part of Interstate was writing from like 2016 into 2018, but from the fall of 2018 into the summer of 2019, I spent all that time researching and writing Interstate the Essay. And then that reconfigured the entire manuscript. So like that's gonna be the lead, that's gonna be the title, everything else has to kind of fall and respond to this lead thing. Um, and then after that, I wrote essays like Spot Check, Daddy's Home, and the Afterward, which is like a kind of a uh, acknowledgement of the pandemic and its impact. So yeah, it, it started very locally when I was living in the Bay Area, and then it, and then interstate when I started taking those trips. It kind of took a lot of time. Um, so yeah, I would say maybe like three or four years. That being said, this book took like a year. It, it was just like a quicker turnaround, and I basically just started writing it after interstate came out, and just knowing what a timeline looks like in terms of like oh like a year after you're done writing it is when it will get come out like what do I do with what do I do now you know like I have all this energy so um yeah that's that's how it happened but again it was very much like behind the scenes like my editor working with this like weird writer that he's not telling anyone about and then finally he's like hey we have a book let's publish it you know so it was like very much this this communique that got turned into like a book Oh, wow. Thank you, online audience. Uh, favorite skate video? I started skateboarding in 1996, so most skaters won't be surprised that Welcome to Hell and Mouse are my favorite skate videos. But if I had to choose one, it's Welcome to Hell by Toy Machine, which is so fun to say in a literary context. Like, what's what's the answer? Welcome to Hell. Um, but yeah, Welcome to Hell. It's on YouTube. It's from Toy Machine Skateboards. If you're familiar with the visual artist Ed Templeton, it's his company, and I um, highly recommend it. Great soundtrack. Yeah. Um, and I'm wondering if, like, you think, like, sort of like the cultural, like, perception of, like, it's very interesting yeah like the question for online is uh has uh 
skateboarding and its culture being kind of welcomed into the Olympics, has it impacted uh, the culture and kind of the, the my my book in terms of you know just how it may be received by like literature in the world and publishers. I did. It was, it was interesting that when I started talking to soft school, like, hey, I want to write a book about skateboarding. To like Olympics, you know, like that was an Olympic immediate reaction because that's in everyone's popular conscious now. It's like Olympics and nobody recognizes Tony Hawk. Like those are the two like funny things, right? Tony Hawk actually had a really good quote, which is the Olympics is lucky to have skateboarding and not the other way around. And I very much agree with that fact. Um, you know, Thrasher magazine explicitly said we're not going to cover the Olympics. You know, a lot of skateboarders kind of chose their different um avenues media representation included i think like tony hawk pro skater the video game 20 20 so years ago and like um, you know these like mid 90s and stuff like that like that kind of popularized skate culture in these different ways or even the x games i think at large the cool thing about skateboarding right now in the wake of social media is that the boys club idea is kind of being demolished there's more female representation pay parity in competitions like the olympics there's trans and queer centered brands like unity and their skateboards so over the past 10 years as we're coming closer to the olympics there's this kind of movement to democratize and make skateboarding this very inclusive space which for a lot of people might contradict being involved with the olympics right but i feel like a lot skateboarding and its purity will never kind of be erased by competition competition's always been a part of skateboarding skaters have made a living with or without doing competition but i think it's cool that some kid in not in america who may not be male or may not be straight can watch the olympics and see people of different identities ripping and being applauded and you know doing their thing i think exposure to skateboarding is is the gateway drug and if it's the olympics so be it you know the olympic the x games has been around since 95 and it and it hasn't killed skateboarding, you know. So it's there's other um there's other language threats to skateboarding which we don't want to get into right now. That uh that uh, the Olympics is kind of the least of our concerns in a certain certain context. But I think it's had overall like a neutral, if not positive, impact. And if it allows skaters to make a living or get additional sponsors to make a living, then more power to them. Anything else? <laughs> Please don't, don't hesitate. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so the question is just around like subcultures in California and also like if there's other subcultures in California that um, I'm curious about or that I might uh, want to talk about in the future. I mean, a lot, like in, in your state, you know, we talk about lowrider culture a lot. We talk about skateboarding. We talk about DJs and radio and all that stuff, kind of dive by culture. Um, I mean, there's a lot. Like California is amazing. Um, there's there's a couple of things that I want to there's a couple of places I want to go to um, like there's a lot of Japanese internment camps that are still around in addition to Manzanar there's other ones kind of closer to the Oregon border that I want to check out but in terms of subcultures to to actually answer your question um, you know like in addition to skateboarding having a boom in the pandemic because it's an isolated sport that you can do outside. Roller skating, you know, floor on the floor had a big renaissance as well. And I'm curious, given that skateboarding is a product of roller, roller you know, taking your roller skates and nailing them to two by fours as surfers did. Like, I'm curious if there's something intersectional there about like roller skating and skateboarding. In Shift, I make references to certain like roller skating moments. Like when the March on Washington started, there was a gentleman from Chicago who roller skated to the March on Washington on behalf of the ACLU. Like finding those moments where just wheels as a as a tool or as a social construct or as like a as a kind of tool for liberation. I'm kind of very much interested in that. Um, wrestling i think is really interesting like like that's a niche subculture in california that i think a lot of folks can write more about um as well as like 
um, like clown culture, for lack of a better term. I'll just kind of put that out there, not to terrorize anyone, but like clown culture. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just stop there. But these are some of the kind of uh, things that I'm intrigued about. So the question is, how has my lens changed since moving to the Central Valley? You know, like I've been I've been living in Sacramento for two years. Um, I lived in Oakland or I lived in the Bay Area for like half my life, Southern California half my life. So it is a big change. I was talking earlier in our class about um, in, in Margaret Rhodes' class about the entering a place and realizing it's a different topography, the different smells, the different the trees, the bugs, like there's a lot of stuff that's different about living in Sacramento, you know what I mean? The cicadas, like like it's just so there's just something that's so immediately different. Um, in general, I think like, I feel like I'm in the Northern California version of where I grew up in the San Gabriel Valley. Like Sacramento feels, it's reminding me that I grew up in the Valley. Obviously a Valley that's like East of Los Angeles and you know, different types of topography with the foothills and beaches and Mount Baldy with the snow as you're standing in the schoolyard, it's a hundred degrees, you know? Um, but it feels very much like where I grew up. So there's kind of like some connectivity there and, and this kind of recognition of like, of the valley of not being the metropolitan epicenter. Um, and I like that. I think one thing that a lot of folks talked about in the Bay Area as we were living there was that the Bay Area was a bubble, that you know it is very much a bubble that you don't necessarily want to pop. And I think interstate very much got me out of my comfort zones and forced me to both realize and remember the different vulnerabilities that we all need, or in my case, I very much needed to write this work. So um, in a sense, like being here is part of a long, longer vulnerability process that started when Interstate started. Um, when I was writing Interstate, I kind of felt like I was writing myself out of the Bay Area, and that kind of became true in a sense of like, I'm writing myself out of the memories I had here, and I'm building, you know, like I, this was all written in Oakland, and I received the book in Sacramento. Very jarring feeling. It's almost like you're receiving a product of your former self. But that being said, it's all that's a little that's like one way of thinking of it. But the other way of thinking of it is like this is almost a return to home in a sense, being here in the valley. So long story short, I enjoy living here and talking to all y'all. There's some great writers here too, and some really creative folks. And um it's pretty humbling being here and realizing the history that precedes me. Sure. Um, so you said on the So I'm just curious, when you start a project, like when like you begin like okay, today I want to write a poem, and then you like try to find a project. It's a very, it's a really cool question. The, the question for folks online is, was just, given that I write across different genres, how do I decide what genre I'm going to write? And does that, do I decide with the genre or is it do the idea comes first and then that leads to the, to the genre? Um, this kind of rem reminds me of, of Zinzi's question earlier too, and I think for me, um, for a lot of time it was the second option of like the idea and like what form is this idea, and for a while I was only thinking like it can only be these certain ways. Like, like I think one of my big frustrations with poetry was that I felt like all of my ideas had to be poems and I wasn't giving myself agency to kind of explore outside of that. Nonfiction gave me that. Um, so the cool thing though is that, you know, sometimes with writing, like say I want to write a profile about a cool pizza shop in Sacramento, you know, what I mean, and I'm pitching that's like a news outlet, you know, like a freelance piece that will have like an editorial like deadline and kind of a timed thing that I have to like respond to and and do that. Whereas like if I have an idea for you know, a piece or a poem or a play, like I can always jot that down and kind of go back to it in my journal at my leisure. 
um, you know, like when I feel like in that mood or in that space. So I feel like a lot of a lot of times it's um, responding to the idea and trying to find the right genre for it. But at the same time, it's like I don't write across all genres like in a single day. You know what I mean? So it's it's kind of momentum as well. Where like the last couple of years, I've been doing a lot of nonfiction, so a lot of that is a lot of my ideas are kind of in that context. Um, like I haven't written a play for a couple of years, but you know I still read plays and I still read across the genres. So I think like reading across the genres keeps the ideation sharp of like maybe I could write that in this way or that way. You know, nonfiction is definitely like, for lack of a better term, the dominating kind of thought process in my head right now. But reading across the genres allows me to kind of stay sharp and fresh of like who's writing what, what's kind of like, what stuff's inspiring me and stuff like that. And I find like I write, I read a lot of journals like The Baffler or stuff like that that has like a little bit of fiction, some nonfiction, some poetry in it, some visual art. And those journals and magazines kind of, um, allow me to feel like I'm looking at a mirror, you know, and it's like, oh, okay, like it's this world in this magazine has, is able to tell all these stories in one place. Um, I kind of draw inspiration from them as I need to, but yeah, usually it's kind of a combination of momentum and just like, and, and allowing the idea to, um, kind of take its form over time. And that's just like a lot of journaling and a lot of reading across genres. So one big thing that I've kind of killed inside of me is feeling like I have to do everything now, you know, and like allowing things to kind of take their pace while still reading and writing as consistently as I can, you know. Cool. Uh, well, all right. Yes. Um, and also a little bit, but. Um, COVID. Yeah. And I'm just wondering if this, you know, you have such a great sense of history, especially within the state, but um, I'm, I'm just curious what your thoughts are of how um, COVID has affected the way that we're living right now and the people to be in the state and even particularly in the Valley. Yeah, I mean, COVID is, uh, COVID was huge, you know, um, in my life, um, it is huge in my life. Um, I write in the afterword of, of Interstate about, you know, a lot of the businesses I frequented that I, I talk about in the book are no longer, you know, friends moving away to be closer to family and whatnot. Um, and finishing the Interstate during that first year of the pandemic kind of added a different significance to it, you know and a different, um, I'm kind of contradicting what I just said, but like, I need to write this now, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I need to get done with this now. Um, I feel like, you know, putting out this book in the pandemic too was a really weird thing. Like amidst all this, all the news and headlines, you know, this book comes out between like the vaccines and the boosters, you know, like this, this little sweet spot where we can maybe gather and have readings and stuff like that. I feel like a lot of the fear of losing place and losing my sense of history that I talk about in Interstate before the pandemic really kind of knocked me over the head when the pandemic actually hit. And it kind of made me look at all this stuff anew. Um, it almost kind of confirmed the previous paranoias of like, I need to document these things. Like, but it also made me question like, why in 2007, when I was an undergrad, did I record my grandfather? Like, why did I do this legwork like years ago um, and how did that lead to where we're at now? Um, knowing what, you know, knowing the, the Bay Area bubble I was in and whatnot, like when this thing is over, what, what do I want to do? Like, what haven't I written? Um, so but the biggest thing I think for me in terms of the pandemic was it, it mitigated that community of writers and creatives of showing up to galleries or readings like we are right now, seeing people talking about what they're working on and, you know, oh, you made a zine, that's cool, thank you, you know, like, all this stuff, like, that's how the connectivity really fueled so much of Interstate and my life in the Bay Area and the, and the creativity therein, that losing that, how do I generate that alone in my apartment, you know, with, with my cat and my mother, you know, like, how do I maintain this energy of the physical spaces that inspires this work inside of me and thus the writing, you know? Um, 
So remembering that sense of energy in addition to that sense of place was something I tried to carry with me into the pandemic. This book is a lot about finding skateboarding as solace during the pandemic and using that as like the one thing that I can do outside in community that um, feels safe. So yeah, it really kind of mitigated a lot of the writing community and like the ability to even present this work in the way that I really wanted to. Um, but it also made me realize that the value of what I was doing before the pandemic and how I need to keep doing that, you know? One last one. What is the most underrated place I visited in California? Ooh. Man, that's a good one. I feel like the Huntington Library in San Gabriel Valley is pretty underrated. It's like this beautiful kind of naturalist garden. Probably the entire Central Valley <laughs> is underrated. Um, Fresno and you know, the community out there um, is really cool. Um, I don't know. I, you know what? To answer your question, Highway 99. I feel like that's probably the most underrated part of, of California. No one drives it. And like, you know, you talk to people that just moved to the Bay Area, they might not know the grapevine, let alone like Highway 99 and stuff like that. So yeah, the lost highway. All right. Thank you all so much for being here. Thanks, Zoomage. Thanks, UC Davis.